Hi there, I'm Paul. This is John. Hello. You might recognise us from uh, the Discover Tenkara uh, project, such as Tenkara in Focus that we've done on YouTube as a free series. This that we're doing right now is going to be a series of several videos actually teaching you some new skills on stream. And it's also going to arm you with techniques, the industry insider tactics, if you like, for judging the quality of the gear that you might want to use um, in your fishing. Um, we had a quite a popular um, yeah, thing earlier uh, on. A few, well, it must be several months ago, even last year, we yeah. put out a PDF guide, sort of insider secrets to testing your Tenkara rod, uh, looking for elements that are sort of good and bad quality amongst different rods at different price points. And we had quite a quite a lot of good feedback from that, didn't we? Yeah, but sometimes if it's on the page, it doesn't necessarily translate very easily into, or you know, you can yeah. sort of get the wrong end of the yeah. stick. It might yeah. not be one hundred percent clear to sort of imagine yeah. what you're actually doing yeah, with the test. It's a little bit like rod ratings: one person six fours, another five. Oh, five. Amanda, yeah. <laughs> don't even you, get me started on you that. You talk about things like recovering a rod, and it means different things to yeah, different yeah, people. Yeah. So, well, yeah. we thought the best thing to do is actually to literally walk through it and actually mm. do a demonstration on video, so that everybody can basically have access to the same tests that the industry insiders use uh, when they're developing and testing um, their own rods. Yeah, yeah. And that way it just means that you can make informed and uh, intelligent decisions on the stuff that you buy. Yeah. And as John says, the, you know, the, the quality does vary and should be expected to vary at different price points and we're going to kind of dig into that yeah. uh, and show you some of those differences. So let's have a look at some of the points that we've got. One of the things I did want to say before we get into that, there's no such thing as one perfect in carry rod. Because every time you make a rod, it's a trade-off between different characteristics. Yeah. And that's really important to, to kind yeah. of actually get across. It's like with almost every tool, isn't it? That there's a compromise at some point because there are things like the laws of physics that get in the way of everybody <laughs> having a good time. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, I don't know. I, I, I remember having lots of conversations with you early days when we were just about discovering uh, Tenkara and the whole sort of yeah. range of techniques that go with it. Linear recovery. You know what yeah, is it, yeah. and and um, it's it's the it's kind of usually the first differentiator of quality that people experience when when they start learning a bit more. Um, bad linear recovery is when the rod bounces. We'll probably put something up on screen. We've we've filmed some good videos, so uh, <laughs> I'll not just be doing this the whole way through. <laughs> but when you make your cast and stop, the rod should unload and mm. recover, and a very good rod does that extremely well and a very bad rod does that extremely badly so instead of unloading and recovering it'll unload it'll recover and then it'll oscillate possibly even over recover but that that's another well, point we'll come itself, which we'll come on to so look, looking at that on screen you, you're probably looking right now at uh, an example of good recovery and bad recovery well what I was going to say is, is that, you know, just the actual basic test itself, when you actually get hold of a rod, is to kind of just give it a bounce like that and look at it against a light background so you can actually yeah. see the tip sort of working. Yeah. Yeah. You want to make, you want to put a good bend into it. Mm. Um, but the other thing is, is that you're going to, even with a fantastic rod, you're going to need to soften your grip as the yeah. rod comes back to the straight position. Yeah. If you hold it, if you're gripping it like, you know, your life depends on it, all rods will oscillate. Mm. The test of a good rod is how much effort you need to put into getting that one bounce and yeah. stop. It, it bounces, it comes straight and stops. If you're having to really work to do that, that's a sign of bad recovery. And what you'll find is, if you have a rod that has very poor recovery, it destroys the, the um, straightness of the bottom leg of your casting loop. Yeah. And that yeah. means you've got no accuracy. Yeah. Um, it just makes the loop a, a series of messy wiggles. Yeah, it's one of right. my favourite teaching points when I'm guiding and, and teaching people casting, talking about softening the grip. Where uh, you know a lot of sort of traditional Western fly fishers tend to really clamp tight at mm. the end at the stop, and on a ten car rod that will put quite a bit of extra oscillation, even in a quite a good rod. If you can loosen the grip, and I often teach mm -hmm. people just to lift a couple of fingers off at the end of the cast when, when they're learning to cast, it helps damp the rod, it helps soften that, that sort of finish to the cast, and if your rod recovers well, it will do that. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that you have to have a great rod either. You can actually mitigate some of the bad properties in bad rods by having a good casting stroke. It'll never make it a great casting rod, but it'll make it a better casting rod 
yeah. than gripping it tight. I could, I, you know, sort of what I was saying is, you know, in the, the first point is that how hard you have to work as an mm. angler is this, is the, the test that you're looking for yeah. here. Yeah. So I think, you know, that that's a very basic thing. The good news is these days there are relatively few rods with terrible linear yeah. recovery. Yeah. And one of, and this is actually neatly, it's almost like we planned this, isn't it? Mm. It neatly brings us on to, the thing is, it, it gets easier to produce a fantastic recovering rod if you have a relatively stiff tip. Yeah. If you put a stiff tip made out of decent, you know, half decent quality graphite in a rod, mm. it will bounce back and come straight yeah. very easily. Yeah. Now, there's two problems with that. One is it makes it difficult to cast lines that are, are light because you don't get the load in the rod, that, that, you know, that bend to actually catapult the line yeah. forwards. But the other more insidious one, and this is present in some of the best selling rods in the world, is that you get what's called, what we've called, over recovery. Yeah. And I'm sure there's probably sort of fly rod designers have probably been across this for donkey's years and, you know, there's probably another name for it. But I, I think it's uh, probably um, would be remiss of us not to flag up that we didn't really know about that until we took these rods we thought were great to Japan. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guys in Japan, you know, they took a cast and you could see they were looking. For a, as polite a response as they could <laughs> because they, frankly they thought the rods were garbage <laughs> um, but then they explained to us why and so you know at the time we, we thought these rods wow this is the best one so far in in the west yeah um and we'll, we'll come on to nylon casting lines in 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 the future in, in yeah, what give it some now. of the t techniques yeah. and secrets yeah. away. <laughs> but, but there's a great test that they showed us to show that over recovery where mm. it's actually kind of visible in the line and it does do a lot of damage to your cast and the thing is is you may have a rod that over recovers you may be casting you may be on a plateau that you can't get past that you don't even know about mm. and it takes having someone like these guys in japan that taught us casting to sort of unlock that next level yeah and I think, again, the way to actually pick that up is you do exactly the same test as we've talked about with the linear recovery. Mm. And what happens is the tip comes back past the straight rod mm. position. And what that means is what you'll feel when you're testing a rod when it does that is you'll put that deep bounce into it. The rod will recover, but you'll feel it. Your hand will actually ride up like this. Or yeah. if you're testing it sideways, it, it will ride out like this. And it's almost like um, like a shotgun riding I was just going to say up. it like muzzle lift on a rifle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just, just that gentle sort of push up. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's not to say that you obviously can't fish with those rods. You, you can, but... But it, we did. Yeah, for, yeah. For and, quite a long time. And, 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 you know, let's go right back to the beginning. People fishing with simple sticks of bamboo. Hmm. You can fish. But the thing is, is if you're looking at it from an aesthetic point of view, you're looking at the quality of the experience and also the greatest range of techniques that are available to yeah. you. The more that you've, you can build up your technique, but then you need the kit to support that technique as well. If you want to go longer and lighter with your lines yeah, yeah, to yeah, the yeah. point where you're getting the, what in many of the sort of circles we've been in, in Japan is the Holy Grail, which is casting number three nylon. Mm. Um, and it's not the kind of nylon that you get on fishing spools for regular fishing in the West. This nylon that they use is a very supple nylon that's got a very sort of specific purpose. Yeah. Um, so it's very, very limp and soft. Um, well, again, that's a nice little tease because some of the fishing techniques we're going to come on to will show you why you might want to use that um, as a technique and what it'll give to you in terms of your catch rate and your fishing experience and that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. So that's over recovery. Yes. Uh, 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 next on the list. We've got a long list to get through, so uh, <laughs> gone. Um, you, yeah, uh, I think you're a fan of this one. Well, yeah, and it's this one was actually brought home to us very strongly in our most recent trip to Japan. But um, it's a good, good way of actually looking at the action of a rod yeah. and where where most of the bend is is happening. But it's this idea of rotational recovery, um, and you you kind of again we'll show some on screen so you can see exactly what we're talking about here. But it's about kind of rotating that rod almost like a skipping rope. Mm, and seeing yeah, and seeing where that kind of standing wave actually develops on the rod as it spirals. But the key thing is, is when you stop, you look at how the the butt and the midsection actually dominates the the rest of the sections, and how long it takes for the movement from your hand to be translated through the blank and then through to the tip, and then for that to come still again. For me, I've got two sort of thoughts on that. Uh, first up, you can have excellent recovering. Uh, mm. linear recovery on a rod and there are a lot of western rods that have now got that great recovery yeah. but the minute you go for rotational recovery it all falls apart you, you do like this skipping rope movement and it just carries on sort of spiraling for, for a fair while after you stop yeah 
And, and the importance for, for a tenkara rod, particularly with ones that you're using in amongst tree cover or obstacles. That's point two. Yeah. <laughs> um, when it comes, you know, people are probably thinking, well, why why does spinning it like that mm. matter? Mm. But it, when you are in amongst cover and you need to make these casts where you might have a tree behind you or there might be a tree or there might be overhanging, you may need to come round and cast like that. And mm. you've probably seen videos of, Japanese masters where they use these huge rotations mm. it may be just a subtle rotation but the minute that that rotation stops and your casting loop is unfurling out to a you know a tiny mm. little spot in stream that might only be this big when you're an accurate caster if you've not got good rotational recovery you may as well just keep circling the rod <laughs> because that's what's happening at the tip end it's, and it's, it's, ha it's how apart. faithfully that tip even if there's a delay as the rod bends and unbends yeah. it's how faithfully that tip then tracks yeah. that movement around and yeah. delivers it yeah. that's that's the thing it's the equivalent it, it, let me just pass you this rod mm. uh, <laughs> uh, 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 yeah your rod's doing that to you in the cast isn't yeah it? Exactly. You, you know when you think you've done something and, and the rod goes cheekily just goes no you don't yeah it kicks and, out yeah it's I, I like it that the the sense i like to when it's got good rotation recovery it it holds its form it holds itself mm. together really well yeah and it, and it just responds it, to even that even a softer rod feels sharp yeah it, you know yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. it can be soft but it doesn't feel floppy it's or sloppy that, yeah interesting thing about tinkara rods they don't have guides on they don't have rod rings on mm. and one of the things with that they don't also have um, a definable spine mm. that you may have depending on how you, your fly rods are actually constructed yeah. These have to work equally in 360 degrees, yeah. um, and that's that rotation recovery comes into that. Um, but with, there's another point actually on that, and when we come back to the walk around test, which is mm. further down the list, which is a similar sort of thing. But yeah, for this test, rotation recovery. Look at where the bend is happening and how well and how faithful that tip sort of tracks around. And you know, we found very, very strongly in Japan this time around. There's some wonderful rods that are fantastic for casting in the overhead plane. But when you're doing some of the more steering around obstacles sort of stuff, you then actually lost the control of the loop and you couldn't put yeah. the, the fly into those very specific current seams, which makes a difference between yeah. catching and not catching in those streams, to be fair. It was uh, a nice experience, wasn't it, when we were fishing with a good friend of ours, mm. a good Japanese friend, and we went to a stream atypical of the type of water he normally fishes, mm. very overgrown. Not quite Genryu, but it was a fair long walk in for two Western guys. Like <laughs> and his, his faithful Japanese rod uh, was awful on the sideways casting plane. And this is one that's a, uh, it's not actually a Tenkara rod, but some of you in the know may recognise The best the way name. to describe it is like before we were saying about the compromises, you always get the mm. rods. It was wonderful, but when it was asked to compromise in that way, yeah. it just didn't really fit the bill for yeah. that. Wonderful rod anyway, yeah. Yeah. but just that, that particular compromise... There's no one perfect rod. Yeah. So that's that was the take yeah. home from yeah. that. Why don't we kick on to um, some of the more mechanical stuff? Do you want to have a look at the? I know this is one of your favourite ones, and it's something that we we learned again quite early on when we were looking at. Um, yeah, I mean this this is one that was uh, I remember vividly when we were shown we were sat on a bench near our syndicate with Dr Ishigaki mm -hmm. looking at a few Western rods. It was the first time of, you know where we spent some length of time with him. He came to visit us in the UK in 2013. Wasn't yeah, it? that's right. Yeah. And we had a week fishing with him, hosting him um, on our waters. And we basically fairly bluntly asked, what do you think of Western rods? And, you know, give us your thoughts on the sort of the manufacture and design. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he did, he, he took a rod apart, he flipped out all the sections and... He showed us a couple of Western rods, you know, the, the, we'll not name any names, but there are a few different Western manufacturers. Again, this comes back to that price point mm. thing. There's different, well, expectations should be different at different yeah. price points. But. One of the sort of key things that he's looking to get rid of in the rods that he works with designing with Japanese companies is slightly, let's say, not square edges to the joints. We'll have a couple of pictures up of good and bad examples. The best thing I can think of is when you cut in like a French baguette or something, mm. you want, you know... You, a straight it, cut versus a slanted yeah, cut. Yeah, exactly. Now, on a tenkara rod, yeah. you don't want that nice garlic bread effect where it's yeah. kind of a slanted yeah. cut. <laughs> and that, that is simply so. When, when you extend a rod, inside there's a portion of the rod that overlaps that causes a joint. Mm. When you don't have complete symmetry, that means that the action as those transitions sort of make their way up the rod is different depending on how, how you have the rod angled. Yeah. And when you talk about rotational recovery, 
there are different levels of flex at different angles, so it sets an almost unbalanced flex in the rod. I sort of wonder whether over time that actually, if you're casting very hard repeatedly, whether that There's flexion a stress on that point, point yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah. It's not I mean, sharing the load equally. Yeah, because obviously every time you ship it up, it's probably, you might end up with like a ring. Yeah. <laughs> so. and, uh, and another thing, it's, it's not as obvious, but that also is a symptom of the overall quality of manufacturing, because if the factory's not getting those joints perfectly square edged, mm. that's an attention to detail that probably ought to be ringing alarm bells about other parts of the process. Yeah, stuff well. that you can't see. Yeah, like yeah. The, you know the graphite, you know the resin mix and yeah. everything else. So I can I can imagine loads of people at home now thinking all, <laughs> yeah, all the hard earned money they've spent on rods opening well. rods and edge sections. <laughs> Um, so uh, sorry if you open your rod up and you've got a slight well, disappointment. Well, whilst, whilst you've got your rod open, what you might as well do, and we'll put some photos up of this as well, um, is just looking at how even the cross section of each section of the rod yeah. is. When you when you reverse the rod out the back of the handle, mm. have a good eyeball at the wall thickness and see how evenly. Because it's yeah. super difficult. I mean, I'm, let's not pretend that this is an easy process. It's super difficult to wrap a piece of cloth around. Uh, a, a forming, you know, a mandrel that actually, that actually mm. moulds it into the right shape and actually get that wall thickness even all the way around. Yeah. Super difficult to do. Yeah. But, you know, the more you pay for your rod, the more even that should be. Yeah. And the stronger it should be yeah. all the way around. And that, those two elements, the, the, the square edges and the wall thickness, were both things that were shown to us by Dr. Ishigaki. And they're a big part of the quality control in rods. He's they are, in. but here's the thing: on some of the rods that are less expensive, that you, again that you're expecting less of, you can often get away with it being a bit more uneven because the wall thickness is likely to be thicker overall. Yeah. So you're just yeah. going to have some inher more inherent strength, yeah. because the the tolerance isn't necessarily needed to be yeah. there because you're going to have a thicker walled a blank. Essentially, a heavier blank yeah. made of heavier, thicker carbon, so it's more resilient over time. Yeah. Um, which is great for beginners. You know, if you're starting out at a cheaper, heavier, more sort of over-engineered rod, may actually serve you better because hundred yeah. percent, you've got to sort of get over the hurdles of uh, how you know how to fish with a ten car rod, and you're likely to make a few mistakes in your in your early days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially if you're completely new to fishing. Mm. You know, if if this is your first sort of adventure in fishing, you're not coming from twenty years fishing another style. Mm -hmm. um, some of the cheaper rods that they, they actually serve you better when you start in then something very very expensive yeah 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 unless cost is no object and mm. in which case mm. you might as well just have the best that you can but that's that's up to you so when you put all of these qualities together um you know you get excellent manufacturing a, a thin wall that's perfectly um mm -hmm. you know the same thickness all the way around square edge joints then the rod should be able to survive uh adgeries famous walk around <laughs> test do you know what i was just going to work, work around to that and you did it for me well, so yeah, there you go yeah, it's, written down. <laughs> it's almost like it's written down isn't it but yeah that that's the thing when you look at the at the cut sections that's the bit of the cross section that you can see mm. but obviously throughout the whole blank there's bits that you can't see either yeah, yeah. and one of the ways of getting a little bit of a handle on that is uh, is this walk around test that and this is something as you said that yeah. kazumi saigo um ajiri uh, san actually kind of really brought home to us and showed us yeah. um, the way of yeah. doing that. This is one that's probably worth having um, a video demo on as well, because although it's yeah. pretty clear in the diagram, yeah. um, and you can see it from the diagram in the PDF, but a decent demonstration of that, it's worth seeing so that you can have a look yourself. But basically, all that it entails is somebody holding the rod, um, standing at the center of what will be a circle that's yeah. kind of drawn around them, angling the rod upwards, and then a person at the other end of the rod attached a short length of line to the lillian, the cord at the end of the, the rod tip, putting a decent sort of fighting bend, I think yeah. that's a good way to sort yeah. of describe the amount of bend that you're looking for, into the rod. Yeah. And then simply walking with, you know, holding the hand at the same height, so you're not kind of putting yeah. more or less tension on, simply walking around at it, holding it at the, the line at a constant um, height above the ground. It's worth sort of you know, put, flashing up some warning right now. <laughs> this is sort of not for the faint of heart. I would recommend wearing some kind of protective gear. You know, <laughs> we, we have to sort of limit our liability here. Yeah. The, the rod could snap. You know, we're talking about testing a rod um, in, in quite a sort of harsh way. What I would say, it's normally a test we would do on a new rod especially mm. when we're developing rods and you, you're looking for you know problems that will, will show up. If, testing to destruction. Yeah. Um, 
it would also probably make a great test for someone who's buying a second hand rod mm. because once a rod's been in use there are chances that edges of the carbon will have been clipped on rocks uh, touched on trees maybe if you fish bead heads the bead head strikes the rod mm. that can set in motion a problem that won't manifest for weeks or even months yeah. uh, where you get delamination inside the carbon Mm. and then you get a failure so if you're buying a second hand rod and you meet the guy who's selling you the rod maybe get him to hold it and do a walk around test yeah you could flag up any problems you know if, if there are any weaknesses well, it may i mean it's between you and the guy you're buying the rod off when you stood there with two pieces of rod yeah i mean sort of he or she may or may not agree to that that's yeah. that test anyway. but yeah. the the thing to say is of caveat for me would be that you don't necessarily have to you know absolutely try and break the rod yeah. when you're doing it you just want to bend it the same yeah. sort of amount that you'd expect to to be you yeah. know experiencing yeah. on a fish we are not looking for butt here no and tip, tip here and <laughs> yeah, walking yeah. around like that it is a very uh, uh what you would expect is a normal fighting curve exactly so in the same way that you would expect it to deal with a fish with that mm. amount of bend yeah that's what you're looking for at that. and when when Adger is doing that he's looking for changes in feel if there's a sudden sort of there's almost like a hump as you as you move around where there may be uneven joints. Yeah, or so, a softening. Or, yeah. yeah, so what you're looking for is that the rod should stay the same shape all yeah. the way around that curve. If it suddenly kind of relaxes, if you like, or if it kind of, like you said, it almost goes over a bump or something yeah. like that yeah. as it goes around, there's some unevenness somewhere in the construction, yeah. and it's, it's a reasonable way of picking that up. Mm. So you don't need to put an, a mega bend in it to actually pick up that difference yeah. in structural integrity as, as you go around the full sort of 360 degrees. I'm thinking it's probably worth uh, checking all the joints before you do that test as well. We can look at that sort of, uh, you know, the overlap on joints. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, probably yeah. a good point to look at next. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's like, you're right, it's it's almost the thing where there's a series of tests you should probably do before you do the walk around yeah. test. Because you, if it's already, you know, if you're already not satisfied on one point, there's no point doing the, the further tests on that. That's, That's it. So this is a, uh, this is a joint. Uh, this is just the bottom two sections of a rod. And if we extend it, it extends out as a rod normally does. But if you don't do this test, you're left to basically purely guessing just how much rod is inside. Mm. And it can be surprising. Um, <laughs> you, might, you, know, you, you don't really want to be on a big fish with... Well, I have one from a very prominent manufacturer. Yes, that, I know. Um, yeah. I can probably put a picture up on screen mm. that's got a horrifyingly... I basically never dared fish with it. It's got yeah. a horrifyingly small amount of overlap. Mm. Uh, what you're looking for is overlap when one extends inside the other, somewhere around this sort of region. Yeah. And it, it'll be slightly less the further up the rod. Yeah, it changes a bit as you yeah. go narrower. Uh, but one way you can check that is take the sections apart, reverse them so that the thin end goes into the thin end of two adjacent sections, and then gently, not, not with any force, gently just push it in until you mm -hmm. feel resistance. The bit that's left over is roughly the overlap. Um, so that's, that's a, a very... giving you an idea of how much contact you've got inside the yeah. previous section. Yeah, um, so fantastic. That's quite a nice way to sort of check that each section overlaps. And if that's, you... well, I was going to say that's a brilliant way of seeing how much overlap you've got. But the second part of that test is how well seated that because it tells you where the, the thickness matches mm. up with that point, but it doesn't tell you. <laughs> professionals all the way yeah. it doesn't tell you how much contact you've got on the inside of the blank so for that you need to use your ears and you, your sensitivity with your yeah. hands do some practice casts. you don't need a line on the rod do some practice casts where you're just bouncing it almost doing that linear recovery test and listen and feel for any ticking or clicking or creaking yeah, yeah. creaking of the joints it'll just tell you how well seated and how well formed mm -hmm. the outside of the previous section is to yeah. the inside of the next one up yeah. if that makes yeah. sense but yeah, that creaking and click test is the way forward. That's pretty much it. Yeah, I think the only, well, the only other thing is that looking at the smoothness of the curve, you don't want any flat spots in the mm. rod. Uh, it wants to be a smooth, progressive curve all the way through. Yeah. And that's what gives you strength across the full um, length of the rod that you've got. There's a big misconception that big fish rods should, should be necessarily mega stiff and tip actioned. You can, it depends on, you know, again, with the trade-offs, you can have an extremely strong rod that's very competent to handle bigger fish that is incredibly flexible, as long as that curve is perfectly smooth and there's no flat yeah. spots causing that weakening yeah. that we were talking yeah. about before. That 
concept of the flat spot that that's not always obvious until you actually sort of do things like the walk around test or actually stand away from a rod and look at a bend while someone else is bending it. Mm. The flat spots can be the kiss of death for big fish rods. Uh, yeah. Some of the big fish rods that uh, that emerged when Tenkaras was first sort of around in the West, they went for quite stiff rods. And at some point, a stiff rod has to have some flex in it to be mm. able to cast a line. So you were getting flat spot in at that sort of, you know, uh, on the join where the 6-4 sort of transition is. Yeah, um, and it just makes it brittle at that yeah, point, basically. Yeah, yeah. But that's the point. That actually, there's some fairly graphic diagrams in the PDF. But do go and download a free copy of it. We'll stick links um, mm. around the video and sort of on screen yeah. as well. Check it out because there's an extra bonus tip in that that's not been in this video. And I think it'll be something that gives you a lot of value and it's definitely worth checking that out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, go ahead, download that. Uh, and then uh, don't forget to join us in the next couple of uh, lessons that we've got. because We've got some fantastic stuff. Yeah, yeah, we, we've planned this uh, almost like a trilogy, let's say. Um, <laughs> so next time we're going to be doing a bit of on-stream tuition, showing you some fishing scenarios, some casting scenarios. And we're going to be looking at getting the most out of your 10 carat equipment. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's upskilling you so you can get the best experience on stream and literally get the best out of your rod as well. So, so. join us for that.